Hello, wanderers in the ancient world, and fellow fans of the History of Ancient Greece podcast. I'm Devin, host of Human Circus, Journeys in the Medieval World, inviting you to join me in wandering into slightly more recent history, in following in the footsteps of 13th century friars as they went overland into the realms of the Mongol Khans, of late 14th century Bavarian crusaders going as captives of the Ottomans to face Timur's hordes, of an English craftsman carrying a present from Queen Elizabeth to Sultan Mehmed III, and of envoys and merchants, who, as we'll see, were often much the same thing. Their movements outline the links of a medieval world that was much more interconnected than you might think, and could reveal surprises, like a Parisian-born silversmith at Mongol Karakorum, or a native of Lancashire working for the Ottoman Sultan. On Human Circus, I tell their stories, and I also put them into their historical context, covering the larger events that they were part of. I've just recently finished a seven-part series on Marco Polo, and I'm four episodes into a series on Robert de Clary and Geoffrey de Viardouin, a pair of participants in the disastrous Fourth Crusade. You can find Human Circus, Journeys in the Medieval World, and all the usual podcasting services, or at my website, humancircuspodcast.com. And now, having made doing the dishes bearable for more than 80 episodes and still going strong, it's Ryan Stitt and the History of Ancient Greece podcast. Hello, I'm Ryan Stitt, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 87, Rhetoric and the Sophists. Rhetorica, or rhetoric, is the art of using language to convince or persuade. In the ancient world, which was a predominantly oral culture, the ability to speak effectively and convincingly was paramount. The earliest evidence of speech-making comes from the Akkadians of Mesopotamia, while later examples can be found in the Assyrian Empire. In ancient Egypt, rhetoric as an art form had existed since at least the Middle Kingdom period. The Egyptians in particular held the ability to speak eloquently in high esteem. In ancient Greece, the earliest mention of the potency of possessing oratorical skill can be seen in Homer's Iliad, where heroes like Achilles, Hector, and Odysseus were praised for their ability to advise and urge on their peers and followers with their efficacy of speech. Because the ancient Greeks highly valued public life and political participation, it's not shocking, then, that rhetoric emerged as a crucial tool to influence public and political life. With the rise of the democratic polis in particular, oratory became the medium through which political and judicial decisions were made, and through which philosophical ideas were developed and disseminated. It wouldn't hurt to be reminded that the wide use and availability of written text is a phenomenon that was just coming into vogue in classical Greece. And so many of the great thinkers and political leaders of the time still performed their works before an audience, usually in the context of a competition for fame, political influence, or cultural capital. Regardless of how and for what reason it was employed, rhetoric remains associated with its political origins. In fact, the word rhetoric comes from rhetor, the Greek term for orator, who was a citizen that regularly addressed juries and political assemblies. And so the rhetor was understood to have gained knowledge about public speaking in the process, though in general, an aptitude with language was often referred to as a logon techne, literally skill with arguments or verbal artistry. By the classical period, rhetoric was such a useful and almost necessary skill that organized thought about what it means to be good at public speaking emerged. And so rhetoric evolved as an important art, one that provided the orator with the forms, means, and strategies for persuading an audience of the correctness of the orator's arguments. Aristotle attributed the first study about the power of language to the philosopher Empedocles, who lived from around 490 to 430 BC, and who we discussed in episode 84, 
Although scholars tend to view this as unlikely, his theories on human knowledge may have inspired many future rhetoricians. The first written manual about rhetoric has been attributed to two men, named Corax and Tisius, and as such, they were said to be the founders of ancient Greek rhetoric. Their work, as well as that of many of the early rhetoricians, developed from their experience as legal advocates in the law courts. Both were from Syracuse, and Tisius was reported to have been the pupil of Corax. Some scholars contend that both founders are merely legendary persons, while others believe that Corax and Tisius were in fact the same person, and the evidence they cite for this is a description in one fragment that reads, Tisius the crow, as Corax is ancient Greek for crow. Furthermore, all that we know about Corax and Tisius comes from references made by later writers, such as Plato, Aristotle, and Cicero. They are said to have lived in Sicily in the 5th century BC, when Thrasybulus was overthrown as tyrant, and a democracy was formed, which took place in 465 BC. Under the Dinomen and tyranny at Syracuse, which we discussed in episode 29, the land and property of many lower-class citizens had been seized. And so when the democracy was formed, these people flooded the courts in an attempt to recover their property. It was with this backdrop that Corax devised his manual on the art of rhetoric in order to permit ordinary men to make their cases in the courts. In doing so, he structured judicial speeches into various parts. The proem, narration, statement of arguments, refutation of opposing arguments, and summary. This structure would remain the basis for all later rhetorical theory. His pupil Tisius is said to have developed legal rhetoric further upon the foundations of his pioneering work, and he is believed to have been the first to write specific speeches that others would deliver in the courts. These men thus had a great impact on the early development of legal practices, as they were highly skilled in argument and were essentially professional litigators. As is the case with Socrates, Corax never wrote any of his teachings himself, and so they were all recorded and published by his pupil, Tisius. The famous, but likely apocryphal story of how Tisius tried to cheat his teacher has been passed down in the introductions to various rhetorical treatises. According to this tale, Corax agreed to teach Tisius under the condition that he would receive his customary payment for his teachings when Tisius won his first lawsuit. On the other hand, if he never managed to win a case, he would not have to pay the fee because the instruction thus would have been useless. However, after their lessons had all been completed, Tisius conspicuously avoided going to court so that he wouldn't have to pay him. Corax then sued Tisius for the fee. His reasoning for doing so is that if he won the case, he would get his pay. But if Tisius won, which would be his first lawsuit victory, he would then have to fulfill the terms of their original agreement and he would be then paid as well. Some versions of the tale end here. Others attribute a counterargument to Tisius that if he lost the case, he would escape paying under the terms of the original agreement, having not yet won a lawsuit, and if he won, there would still be no penalty, since he would be awarded the money at issue. At this point, the judge threw both of them out of his court for being such a nuisance. Out of everything that Corax developed in his manual, he is probably best known for the reverse probability argument, also known as the art of Corax. If a person is accused of a crime that he is not likely to have committed, for example, a small man physically attacking a large man, against whom he is almost certainly doomed to fail, his defense will be that it is unlikely that the crime occurred. His argument draws on the lack of means for the accused. However, if a person is accused of a crime, which he is likely to have committed, in the case of a larger man attacking a smaller man, for example, he can also use the defense that it is unlikely that he did it, for the very reason that it appears to be too probable. And so, this man draws on the lack of prospect of getting away unsuspected. The reverse probability argument here works by anticipating the audience's expectations, and then combating that expectation with a countermove. This pattern of anticipating and then contradicting an audience's expectation has continued to be a typical move in reverse probability arguments to this day. Of course, another countermove of the same type can also be employed, as it could be argued that the large man could have committed the crime precisely because he thought he would be too obvious a suspect, and then another, and then another. For this reason, the art of Corax has been labeled a logical paradox. Although Corax developed these basic principles of argument specifically for the law courts, it wouldn't be long before these properties were applied to other rhetorical uses, particularly in the political assembly, 
In addition, teaching and oratory was not contained to just Syracuse, but was popularized throughout the Greek world in the 5th century BC, with the emergence of a new kind of itinerant teacher. Although these men taught in many Greek cities, they particularly flocked to Athens, which by now had reached a state of complete radical democracy. This means that all citizens in the ecclesia reached important decisions, all citizens had the right to take part in the debate, and all citizens were eligible for public office. And so, in order to influence the assembled people to one's own way of thinking and to become politically powerful, it was more necessary than it had ever been in the past for an Athenian to be a good public speaker, and more specifically, to be good at the type of persuasive rhetoric that Corax and Tisius had developed. Furthermore, this was a time when all kinds of traditional beliefs, especially those about religion, were being critiqued, as philosophers and scientific thinkers were developing and spreading new ideas about the world and about men and morality specifically. Hand in hand with this movement was this new type of teacher called the sophistes, or sophists. At the root of their name is the word sophia, or wisdom, and so their name means experts, literally those who have become wise. They were lecturers who traveled from city to city, teaching rhetoric and public speaking especially, but also all of the other important subjects that were not being covered by an Athenian's traditional education, which we discussed in episode 77. Included were the subjects of philosophy, physics, astronomy, medicine, and geometry, among others. These more narrow-focused fields of study all emphasized the development of philosophical insight and the questioning of conventional beliefs all within a framework of being able to speak logically and persuasively. In particular, the societal roles that the sophists filled in 5th century BC Athens would have important ramifications for the Athenian political system at large. And it is no coincidence that Athens became more and more democratic during the period in which the sophists were most active in Athens. The sophists, especially in the early days, were likely to have been non-Athenian, since Athens was particularly accommodating to non-Athenian medics in terms of providing for freedom of speech, and the fact that Athens was the wealthy cultural hub of the Greek world at that point, they all eventually ended up at Athens to teach its young citizens about the art of rhetoric. They charged for their teachings, and due to the importance of such skills in the litigious social life of Athens, they often commanded very high fees. And so the sons of the more wealthy, who could afford it, flocked to study under them, when a sophist arrived in a particular area, in an effort to attract as many students as possible, they typically gave both public and private demonstrations to prospective students. The training that their students would undergo was intended to make them successful statesmen, and new rhetorical techniques were developed and taught over the 5th century BC. Whereas in the traditional educational curriculum, literature, such as Homer, was studied for its moral lessons, with the sophists, literature was studied not so much for its content, but for its style, to improve the student's ability as a wordsmith and a public speaker. They defined parts of speech, analyzed poetry, parsed close synonyms, invented argumentation strategies, and debated the nature of reality. In this endeavor, their students were taught how to use words more so to win an argument or persuade others, rather than how to reach some sort of objective truth. While virtually everybody who studied with the sophists would learn the art of rhetoric, the other subjects that a young man could study would vary and depended on the instructor. Each sophist was different, so there were numerous differences among their teachings, and they lectured on a diverse set of subjects, though some of the sophists claimed to be able to teach any subject at all, and no doubt their skill as speakers often allowed them to sound impressive on subjects about which they really knew very little. Such behavior on the part of some gave the whole group of sophists a bad name in the minds of many. Yet there's no question that the best were very good teachers. Collectively, those who flourished during the 5th century BC are known as the old sophists to be distinguished from the new sophists of the following century. Noteworthy among the old sophists were Protagoras of Abdera, Gorgias of Leontini, Hippias of Elis, Prodicus of Chios, and Thrasymachus of Chalcedon. These men would all find prominent roles in a few of Plato's dialogues. In addition, Aspasia of Miletus, the paramour of Pericles, is believed to have been one of the first women to engage in private and public rhetoric instruction as a kind of sophist. Even youths who only studied rhetoric would still learn from a good sophist a large amount of literature, logic, and ethics as part of the training necessary for the future orator and statesman. 
And so, in the absence of universities, the sophists provided higher education that differed sharply from earlier forms of education, which, as we discussed in episode 77, was a blend of indoctrination and socialization intended to foster traditional values and taught nothing of such subjects as philosophy, physics, astronomy, medicine, or geometry. The sophists, like the physiologoi, challenged conventional beliefs, particularly in regards to nomos, which can mean both law and custom. There were state-sanctioned nomoi that forbade things like burglary, so in this case it meant laws, but there were also nomoi based on societal tradition, or customs, such as how one should behave in a certain setting, or how to best worship a particular deity. In a society that had existed for centuries without written law, only a blurry line divided a legal nomos and a conventional nomos based on tradition. The line between the two, though, began to diverge quite a bit throughout the 5th century BC, as the multiplicity and diversity of nomoi in different cultures revealed that local customs were the product of tradition rather than some abstract, unchanging principles of right and wrong. In the words of Herodotus, quote, each society considers its own customs to be best, end quote. When this idea was assimilated to the speculations of the natural philosophers, an opposition evolved in many minds between the concept of nomos and physis, or nature. In other words, there exist laws that are natural to all humans, and laws that are specific to certain cultures. Since the concept of natural law was at variance with the traditional view that law ultimately was handed down from the gods, these new ways of looking at the world would have serious implications for the relations between gods and mortals. In addition, although the sophists were highly esteemed teachers, they also garnered a reputation of mistrust, especially by affluent Athenians who were generally suspicious of anyone who took fees for work, since in their eyes, inherited wealth and farming one's own land were the only respectable forms of income, as we discussed in episode 68. Others who were not as well off also resented the sophists because they could not afford to pay what they had charged. Furthermore, it was unclear just what skill these people were teaching and by what right they were charging their fees. For example, it's easy to see how an experienced flute player could teach flute playing or how a gifted boxer could teach boxing. But it was much harder to understand by what metrics someone was qualified to receive money for offering instruction and getting ahead in politics and in life. In many ways, then, the sophists were the political consultants of the Greek world, and they inspired many people to complain grouchily, and probably enviously, about what they were selling that was making them so rich. In particular, for all parents who have gone head-to-head with a smart-alecky teenager that thinks he or she knows it all, one might be able to sympathize with the elder generation of Athenians here who for the first time found themselves confounded at every turn by the smugness of a new generation that had studied the art of argumentation. And so the sophists taught a new brand of rhetoric, using argumentative tricks intended to one-up an opponent or to persuade others without regard for the truth. And they did so for an exorbitant fee. It was because of these reasons that the sophists were squarely condemned by Socrates in various dialogues by Plato as well as by Xenophon in his memorabilia and Aristotle in several of his treatises. For example, in the treatise titled Sophistical Refutations, Aristotle warns the reader about the tricks of the sophists and how to avoid them. But concern for clever speaking was not just limited to the philosophical, as Euripides in his unsettling portrait of Jason in his play Medea, and Thucydides in his representation of power politics in his history of the Peloponnesian War, Both show how rhetoric could be employed to confuse the listener in regards to the old-fashioned principles of right and wrong. Because of this hostility and negative view, and the resulting influence that these teachers had, the word sophist nowadays has a negative connotation for someone who argues cleverly, but also dishonestly. Essentially, a sophist is intended for those who use deceptive and a highfalutin style of rhetoric to win arguments, instead of letting the facts speak for themselves. There are very few writings from the first generation of sophists, because either they didn't write anything, or what they did write hasn't survived. In some cases, there are original rhetorical works that are still extant, allowing the author to be judged on his own terms. But in most cases, knowledge about what individual sophists wrote or said comes from fragmentary quotations that lack context or from much later sources, like Diogenes Laertes, 
Furthermore, most of the information that we have about them is known primarily through the aforementioned writings of those who are hostile to them, which makes it difficult to assemble an unbiased view of their practices and beliefs. Naturally, then, the sophists are typically depicted in an unflattering light, and it is unclear how accurate or fair the representation of them may be. As a whole, Plato treated them with a mixture of humor, fascination, and disdain. However, despite their opposition and poor reputation in literary sources, it is clear that the sophists' contributions were major, as they had a vast influence on a number of spheres, including the growth of knowledge and on ethical and political theory. Their teachings, although controversial, had a huge influence on philosophical thought in 5th century BC Athens, particularly on Socrates and Plato. Whereas only one Platonic dialogue was named after a pre-Socratic philosopher, that being Parmenides, Plato wrote dialogues named after four sophists, Protagoras, Gorgias, Hippias, and Euthydemus. Another dialogue is simply called the sophist, in which the characters try to define the word sophist and discover its difficulty. The sophists also played a major role in the Republic, which concerns justice, the order, and character of the just city-state, and the just man, as well as the Theotetus, which concerns the nature of knowledge. In essence, the sophists turn away from the theoretical natural science to the more rational examination of human affairs for the betterment and success of human life. Arguably, there is no figure who exemplified not only this, but the challenging of traditional convention by the sophists, then Protagoras. In his dialogue, named after the famous sophist, Plato credits Protagoras with having invented the profession of sophism, and so because of this tradition, scholars have typically designated him as being the first sophist. Protagoras is believed to have lived from around 490 to 420 BC. The dates of his lifetime are not recorded, though, but are extrapolated from Plato's dialogue. In the Protagoras, before a gathering of Socrates and two other sophists, Prodicus and Hippias, the elderly Protagoras stated that he was old enough to be the father of any of them, which suggests a birth date between 490 to 480 BC. Regardless, he was born in Abdera, which sat on the Thracian shoreline opposite the island of Thassos. According to the 2nd century AD Roman author, Aulus Gellius, he originally made his living as a porter. But one day, the philosopher Democritus, who was also from Abdera, chanced upon him. Protagoras was carrying a load of small pieces of wood that he had tied with a short cord. And after seeing that Protagoras had tied the load together with such perfect geometric accuracy, Democritus concluded that he must be a mathematical prodigy, and so he promptly took him in into his own household and taught him philosophy. Despite the fact that this anecdote probably isn't true, scholars aren't in agreement whether there was even a connection between these two men. At the very least, Protagoras did not share his mentor's enthusiasm for the pursuit of mathematics. According to the 1st century BC Epicurean philosopher Philodemus, in regards to mathematics, Protagoras said, quote, The subject matter is unknowable and the terminology distasteful, end quote. In fact, since Protagoras was skeptical about the usefulness and the application of theoretical mathematics to the natural world, he did not believe that mathematics was really worth studying at all. Protagoras himself became an educator in Abdera, but shortly after he began teaching, he chose not to limit himself to just his home polis and instead traveled and taught throughout the Greek world, making it as far west as Magna Graecia. Although it's not mentioned in the sources, it's easy to speculate that during his time in Sicily, he may have achieved some familiarity with the rhetorical teachings of Corax and Tisius. This is because the art of rhetoric played a central role in his teachings. In fact, Diogenes Laertes even states that he was one of the first to take part in rhetorical contests that were witnessed by attendees in the Olympic sanctuaries during the Games. The city that Protagoras preferred, though, and the one that he visited most often, was Athens, where he became well-known as a teacher of rhetoric, grammar, and pedagogy. He was so confident in his instruction that he would accept his payment, whatever his students felt that his instruction was worth. He even became a close friend to many of the most famous figures of the period, such as Euripides, Callias, and Pericles. In fact, Plato's dialogue takes place at the home of Callias, who often hosted Protagoras when he was in town and Protagoras appears in Plutarch alongside Pericles in one particular anecdote in which the two spend an entire day discussing an interesting point of legal responsibility that probably involved a more philosophical question of causation. 
He asked Pericles, quote, In an athletic contest, a man had been accidentally hit and killed with a javelin. Was his death to be attributed to the javelin, to the man who threw it, or to the authorities responsible for the conduct of the games? End quote. Furthermore, Pericles so revered Protagoras that in 444 BC, he assigned to him the task of framing the laws for Thurii, a newly constituted Pan-Hellenic colony in southern Italy that was formed under the auspices of Athens. We will discuss Thurii more in a future episode. Anyways, Pericles also entrusted the education and upbringing of his children to Protagoras, showing clearly the extent of his esteem for the teacher. Very few fragments of Protagoras' works have been preserved, though. Various writers such as Plato, who, as we mentioned, wrote an entire dialogue with him as a central figure, have also saved some information about his teachings. Thanks to Plato and Diogenes Laertes, we do have a list of writings attributed to Protagoras, and their titles show that rather than being an educator who offered specific practical training in rhetoric, public speaking, or argumentation, Protagoras attempted to formulate a reasoned understanding, on a very general level, of a wide range of human phenomena, including language and grammar. For example, Diogenes Laertes reports that Protagoras devised the classifications of speech acts, such as assertion, question, answer, command, and so forth. Aristotle also says that Protagoras worked on the classification and proper use of grammatical gender. In one of his writings, called Techne Aristikon, literally the art of wrangling, Protagoras used wrestling as a metaphor for intellectual debate. And so the term aristix now refers to a type of debate or argument that aims at winning rather than reaching the truth, which is something that not only Protagoras, but the sophists in general, were famous for, as we mentioned earlier. Diogenes Laertes relays one anecdote in which one of Protagoras' pupils refused to pay him anything for his instruction, and so he took him to court to settle the matter. Protagoras didn't do this, though, just to force the pupil to pay him, but to prove a point. Before the trial, he told the pupil that he should just go ahead and cough up the fee in advance, because after all, the student would either win or lose his case. If he lost and Protagoras won, he would have to pay the fee. But if he won, it would prove that Protagoras had earned his fee anyways, because he taught his student how to argue effectively in court, especially in favor of something that clearly was the weaker legal argument. Although the authenticity of this anecdote cannot be confirmed, as it is quite similar to the one we described earlier with Corax and Tisius, Protagoras was a pioneer in what would become a typical sophistic methodology. He was quoted to have said that on any matter, there are two arguments opposed to one another that could be made by the same individual. And Aristotle criticizes Protagoras for having claimed that he has the ability to make the weaker argument the stronger. The disturbing implication is that if one can argue on both sides of a debate effectively, then arguing won't get to the truth, which is what the philosophers were after. And so instead, their listeners will be persuaded not by substance, but by whichever argument is more effective. This must have been so prevalent and probably frustrating that many Greeks believed that there was no limit to what sophists would use their persuasive rhetoric to defend. For example, the comic playwright Aristophanes especially satirized the sophists as hair-splitting wordsmiths. In the clouds, he mocks the sophists, as well as Socrates, by parodying Socrates into a quintessential sophist who teaches his pupils how to make the worst case appear to be the better, without any regards for the truth. Specifically, the elder man, Strepsiades, seeks the help of Socrates in an effort to avoid paying his debts. And so Socrates promises to teach Strepsiades' son to argue his way out of paying his debts. For many reasons, though, Socrates was similar to the sophists. And although this was comedy, there no doubt were many who felt that sentiment. However, there were very critical differences. But we will talk about the life of Socrates specifically when we cover Plato and Xenophon in future episodes. Protagoras is also credited with developing the philosophy of moral relativism that many would come to associate with the sophists. The best example of this can be seen in a treatise known as Disoi Logoi, or Double Arguments, which was written by a later anonymous sophist, and it's intended to show how each side of several philosophical issues can be both just and unjust, and how to argue for both sides effectively, and thus win. For example, it asks questions like, Can sickness ever be good? They would say certainly if you are a doctor. But what about death? Well, they would argue that death is good for undertakers and gravediggers. 
The author then goes on to list many examples of the cultural differences found in Herodotus's histories. In order to demonstrate that no act is intrinsically good or bad, so that both sides of the argument can have equal merit, depending on one's perspective. A universe in which nothing was purely good or patently evil was not one in which many of the philosophers wished to dwell, though. It would probably be this reason more than anything else that the philosophers would come to regard the sophist training as antithetical to the pursuit of philosophy. They did so in part because they took a relativist stance on morality, whereas Plato was an idealist philosopher who believed that virtue was non-negotiable, so to speak. Protagoras discussed his views of moral relativism in his work called Truth, also known as Refutations. Although we no longer have this work and knowledge of it is limited, discussion of Protagoras' relativism is based on a quote of his found in Plato's Theotetus. It began with one of his most famous statements, and one that effectively summarizes the core of Protagoras' philosophical teachings. Quote, Man is the measure of all things, of the things that are, that they are, of the things that are not, that they are not. End quote. By this, Protagoras meant that each individual is the measure of how things are perceived by that individual. Therefore, things are, or are not, true according to how the individual perceives them. For example, person X may believe that the weather is cold, whereas person Y may believe that the weather is hot. According to Protagoras, there is no absolute evaluation of the nature of a temperature, because the evaluation will be relative to who is perceiving it. The implication here is that there are no absolute truths. Truth, therefore, is relative and differs according to each individual. And although each individual can judge what is true for him or herself, nobody is in a position to judge what is true for anyone else. Plato also ascribes to Protagoras an early form of phenomenalism, which is the belief that human knowledge is founded on the realities or appearances presented to the senses. In other words, the way something is or appears for a single individual is true or real for that individual. However, as described in Plato's Theotetus, Protagoras also believes that some views may result from having an ill body or mind whose senses may not be functioning appropriately. Therefore, he stressed that although all views may appear equally true, and perhaps should be equally respected, they certainly are not of equal gravity. And so one view may be useful and advantageous to the person who has it, while the perception of another may prove harmful. Hence, Protagoras believed that the sophist was there to teach the student how to discriminate between different views, meaning to teach virtue. Protagoras, thus, was known as a teacher who addressed subjects concerned to virtue and political life. In Plato's Protagoras, he claims to teach, quote, the proper management of one's own affairs, how best to run one's household, and the management of public affairs, and how to make the most effective contribution to the affairs of the city by word and action, end quote. Beginning with Protagoras, most sophists didn't just claim to be teaching the ability to speak well or persuasively, but instead they claimed to be teaching something with enormous value, that being the idea of arete, meaning excellence or virtue. Both in the management and administration of one's affairs in their household, and in civic affairs as well. Traditionally, it was believed that only aristocratic birth qualified a person for arete, and so those from the aristocratic families dominated politics. The importance of rhetoric in the political arena can be seen as far back as Homer, as we mentioned, where the ability to be persuasive in public is a prized asset amongst the leading aristocrats. However, in the 5th century BC, the idea was introduced that the old Homeric concept of arete actually could be achieved through training rather than being the prerogative of noble birth. Protagoras especially was involved in the question of whether virtue could be taught, which is the central thesis of Plato's dialogue named after him. The dialogue begins with Socrates, relating the story of how his young friend, Hippocrates, not the physician or the geometer, came knocking on his door before daybreak and roused him out of his bed. Hippocrates had heard that Protagoras was in town, at the home of Callias, and was in a big hurry to have an audience with him. Socrates warns the excitable Hippocrates that sophists are dangerous. He tells him that the words of the sophists go straight into the soul and can corrupt a person straight away. Socrates says that buying wisdom from a sophist is different from buying food and drink at the market. Because with food and drink, you never know what you are getting, but you can always consult experts for advice before consuming anything that might be dangerous. Whereas with sophism, you can't. 
When they finally arrived at Callias' home, 21 people in total are named as being present, and the main argument between Protagoras and Socrates occurs. Although we must be careful when using Plato's dialogues to discern the true nature of any given sophist, most scholars think the great speech that Plato puts in Protagoras' mouth probably accurately represents the real Protagoras' views. In it, Protagoras does not deny that he is a sophist, and in fact, he claims that it is an ancient and honorable art, the same art practiced by Homer and Hesiod. The only exception, though, is that these poets use the art as a front to protect themselves from the charge of sophism, and that he is more straightforward than the ancient artists, trainers and musicians, and frankly admitting that he is an educator. Socrates then asks Protagoras that if he is an educator, in what respect will his friend Hippocrates improve by associating with him, in the manner that by associating himself to a doctor he would improve in medicine? Protagoras begins his lengthy discourse with a statement that a good sophist can make his students into good citizens. Socrates says that this is fine and good, but that he personally believes that this is not feasible since virtue cannot be taught. He adds that although techne, meaning art or skill, can be imparted to students by teachers, sophia, or wisdom, cannot be. Using as one example, Socrates points to the fact that while in matters concerning specialized labor, one would only take advice from the appropriate specialist, such as builders about construction, but in the matters of the Athenian state, everyone's opinions are considered, which proves that political virtue is within everyone. Protagoras says his claim that virtue can be taught could be better illustrated by a story than by reasoned arguments, and he recounts a myth about the origins of living things. He says that Epimetheus, whose name means afterthought, was assigned the task of passing out the assets for survival, but forgot to give mankind anything. So his twin brother Prometheus, whose name means forethought, stole fire from Hephaestus and practical wisdom from Athena and gave them to mankind. However, mankind was never granted civic wisdom or the art of politics, both of which belonged to Zeus, and as a result, human race was initially in danger of extinction. Zeus, though, sent Hermes to distribute shame and justice equally amongst human beings. To Protagoras, this answers Socrates' question as to why people think that wisdom about architecture or medicine is limited to the few, while wisdom about justice and politics is thought to be more broadly understood. Protagoras' rebuttal portrays political virtue as a gift from the gods to mankind that is doled out equally to all, and so everyone can partake, unlike the more specialized skills. He then goes on to say that it is for this reason that we punish people when they fall short of virtue, and since not everyone is virtuous, this is where Protagoras and the Sophists come in, as they can teach people how to be more virtuous than they are by nature. Socrates then asks that if virtue is teachable, then why do the sons of virtuous men often lack virtue? In response, Protagoras lays out a thought experiment where a hypothetical city-state is resting its survival in the skill of flute playing. A ludicrous thought experiment for sure, but let's go with it. Anyways, since flute playing is the most important thing for that society, parents would be eager to teach this skill to their sons. Not everyone would be successful, though, as some would have a greater natural inclination than others would, and often the sons of good flute players would turn out bad, and vice versa. Any of them, though, even the bad ones, would be better than an average citizen in the real world who might have never been taught how to play. The same goes for virtue, as it is considered so important that everyone is taught it to a certain degree, to the point that it seems like a part of human nature, while it is not. Socrates then asks Protagoras if the attributes that form virtue, such as bravery, kindness, wisdom, and so forth, are one or many things, like for example the parts of a golden object, which are fused together, or the parts of a face, which form a whole while retaining their individual substances. Protagoras responds, but avoids engaging in dialogue and digresses into a speech, which does not answer the question sufficiently at all, but still manages to arouse the excitement of the young public. Socrates complains that Protagoras is long-winded, like a gong that booms when you strike it and won't stop until you lay a hand on it. It is a typical moment of Socrates, opposite a sophist, where the latter is using eloquent speech to hide arguments that might not stand logical scrutiny, while the former is trying to use this notorious question-and-answer format that will lead to a logical conclusion in his favor. Protagoras begins to bristle at this, and so Socrates supposes that their styles are opposite. He personally doesn't like long-winded speeches like the one Protagoras just delivered, because he says he's forgetful and cannot follow the train of thought. And Protagoras does not like to be peppered with questions that seem to lead them off track. 
A frustrated Socrates gets up to leave, complaining that companionable talk is one thing, but public speaking is another. After the intervention of several of the listeners, the men agree to compromise their styles so that the discussion could continue. In the end, Socrates seems to have won the argument, but he comes to the fact that if all virtue is knowledge, it can in fact be taught, which is the central thesis of Protagoras' argument. And so he draws the conclusion that to an outside observer, the two of them would seem crazy since they argued at great lengths only to have mutually exchanged positions with Socrates now believing that virtue can be taught and Protagoras that all virtues are one instead of his initial position. Furthermore, Protagoras acknowledges that Socrates is a noteworthy opponent in dispute while being much younger than he and predicts that he could become one of the wisest men alive. Socrates then departs and the dialogue comes to an end. The Protagoras is important not only because it lays out many of the core tenets of Sophism, but also shows many of the general frustrations that the philosophers probably had with them. It is generally believed that in response to Protagoras and his fellow Sophists, Plato began the search for transcendent forms of knowledge, which could somehow anchor moral judgment. Along with the other Sophists and Socrates, Protagoras was part of a shift in philosophical focus from the earlier pre-Socratic tradition of natural philosophy to an interest in human philosophy. He emphasized how human subjectivity determines the way we understand, or even construct our world, a position that is still an essential part of the modern philosophical tradition. Protagoras also was a proponent of agnosticism, as he questioned the traditional notions about the Greek gods. Reportedly, in his lost work, titled On the Gods, he wrote, quote, Concerning the gods, I have no means of knowing whether they exist or not, nor of what sort they may be, because of the obscurity of the subject and the brevity of human life. End quote. According to Diogenes Laertes, this sort of outspoken, agnostic position taken by Protagoras eventually aroused great anger in Athens, causing the Athenians to expel him from the city, and all copies of his books were collected and symbolically burned in the Agora. Cicero also mentions the deliberate destruction of his works. Afterwards, Protagoras tried to flee to Sicily, but he drowned on the voyage when a ship sank. Scholars doubt these accounts, though, as both Diogenes Laertes and Cicero wrote hundreds of years later, and his contemporaries, who make extensive references to him, mention no such persecution of Protagoras. Even if some copies of Protagoras' books were burned, enough of them survived to be known and discussed in the following century by Plato. Regardless, in Plato's Mino, Protagoras is said to have died at approximately the age of 70, after 40 years as a practicing sophist. His death, then, may be presumed to have occurred around 420 to 410 BC. Alongside Protagoras, the other early and influential figure among the first generation of sophists was Gorgias, who was born sometime between 485 and 480 BC in Leontini on the island of Sicily. Gorgias was reputed to have lived to be 108 years old, which, depending on the year he was born, would put his death around 380 to 375 BC. Regardless, several ancient accounts report that as a youth, he was a pupil of Empedocles in the Eleatic school, although he would have only been a few years younger than his mentor. Regardless, if this is true, like Protagoras, he became more interested in persuasion rather than philosophy, and he learned rhetoric from Corax and Titius of Syracuse. Armed with the ability to speak well and persuasively, he quickly became influential in the politics of Leontini and beyond. Though very little of the specifics are known, he must have achieved such an important status that by the time he was in his 50s in 427 BC, he was chosen, alongside Titius, to lead a delegation from Leontini to Athens in order to seek their military assistance against aggression by Syracuse. The two emissaries presented themselves in the Athenian Agora, where they alternated speaking on the podium. Gorgias delivered a series of speeches that aroused the admiration of the crowd and won him fame and notoriety. The ultimate result was that they were able to complete their mission as they persuaded the Athenians to ally themselves with Leontini. Gorgias then settled in Athens, probably due to the enormous popularity of his style of oratory and the profits that he could make from his performances and rhetoric classes. According to Aristotle and Plato, his students included Isocrates and Mino, and he may have been one of Aspasia's instructors as well. According to Philostratus, in his Lives of the Sophists, Gorgias attracted the attention of the most admired men in Athens, including the young Critias and Alcibiades, and the elder Thucydides and Agathon. Like other sophists, Gorgias was an itinerant who traveled and practiced in various cities throughout Greece, but he was especially fond of Athens and visited it frequently. 
His reputation spread everywhere, and he was especially admired in Boeotia and Thessaly, where in Larissa, he, quote, succeeded in making the distinguished members of the House of the Alavidos fall in love with wisdom, end quote. Gorgias also gave public exhibitions of his skill at the great Panhellenic centers of Olympia and Delphi. He spoke during the Peloponnesian War and often exhorted the Greeks to make peace among themselves at these Panhellenic gatherings. After one Pythian oration, he is said to have installed a solid gold statue of himself in the Temple of Apollo at Delphi, which, if true, would have been the first gold statue to be erected for a human among the ancient Greeks. Regardless, this is a testimony to the enormous fees that the men of his profession commanded, as well as to the high regard that the people generally held them, even if the philosophers loathed them. He won admiration for his ability to speak on any subject, and as a result, he accumulated considerable wealth. According to Philostratus, Gorgias began the practice of extemporaneous oratory, meaning that he would ask the audience for a subject that they would want him to speak on, and he would then give impromptu speeches. Because of this, he boasted that he knew everything and could speak on any subject. The term macrologia, literally meaning large words, refers to the use of more words than is necessary in an effort to appear eloquent and is sometimes used to describe Gorgias' oratorical technique. Gorgias' speeches were intended to be performative and persuasive, and he was the first orator known to develop and teach a distinctive style of speaking, as he ushered in rhetorical innovations involving structure and embellishment. He believed that rhetoric is a techne, with which one could persuade an audience toward any course of action, and he would make his point by systematically refuting a series of possible alternatives. In addition, the performative nature of Gorgias' speeches are exemplified by the way that he playfully approaches each argument with a vast array of stylistic devices, such as metaphors. In particular, he introduced the paradoxologia, or the idea of paradoxical thought and paradoxical expression. While Gorgias primarily used metaphors and paradoxes, he also famously used figures of speech, or schemata. This included balance clauses, or isocolon, the joining of contrasting ideas, or antithesis, the structure of successive clauses, or parison, and the repetition of word endings, or homeoteleton. He paid particular attention to the sounds of words, which, like poetry, could captivate listeners, and his fluid, rhyming style seemed to hypnotize his audiences. Though he was not the earliest, for these advancements, Gorgias has been labeled the father of sophistry. Gorgias went to great lengths to exhibit his ability of making an absurd, argumentative position appear stronger. Consequently, each of his surviving works defend positions that are unpopular, paradoxical, and even absurd. Many of Gorgias' speeches are referred to and quoted by Aristotle, but unlike most of the sophists, two of his works, The Encomium of Helen and The Defense of Palamedes, are believed to have survived in their entirety. We also have a small, extensive fragment of an epitaphios that he wrote for some of the Athenians who were killed in the Peloponnesian War, and this text is considered to be an important contribution to the genre of funeral orations. As we discussed in episode 79, well-known orators delivered such funeral orations during public burial ceremonies in Athens, at which those who died on the battlefield were honored. Gorgias' text provides a clever critique of 5th century BC propagandist rhetoric in imperial Athens, which some believe was the basis for Plato's parody, Menexenix. In the defense of Palamedes, Gorgias defends a man against the charge of treason. In myth, in order to avoid going to Troy, Odysseus pretended to have gone mad and began to sow his fields with salt. But when Palamedes came to recruit him, he guessed what was happening, and so he placed Odysseus' young son, Telemachus in front of the plow, which forced him to stop plowing and thus reveal himself to actually be sane and faking it. Odysseus never forgave him for ruining his attempt to stay out of the war, though. So at one point, when Palamedes had advised the Greeks to return home, Odysseus hid gold in his tent and wrote a fake letter purportedly from the Trojan king Priam. The letter was found and the Greeks falsely accused Palamedes of being a traitor. Soon after, Palamedes was condemned and stoned to death by Odysseus and Diomedes. Gorgias gives an oration through the mouthpiece of Palamedes, and in it, he focuses on the invention of arguments necessary to exonerate Palamedes within the setting of a fictional trial. The speech deals with issues of morality and political commitment, and is concerned with experimenting with how a plausible argument, or topos, can cause conventional truths to be doubted. Throughout the text, Gorgias presents a method for composing arguments from possibility that are either logical, logos, ethical, ethos, or emotional. 
pathos, which are similar to those described later by Aristotle in his dialogue, called rhetoric. Aristotle describes these type of arguments about motive and capability as forensic topoi. Gorgias rejects the use of pathos, though, but prefers to use ethos and logos as his instruments of persuasion. All of his arguments in the speech depend upon probability. Of the three divisions of speeches, forensic, deliberative, and epideictic, discussed later by Aristotle in his rhetoric, the defense of Palamedes is an epideictic, which comes from the verb deiknunai, meaning to show, so that it is a show-off type speech intended to display a high level of oratorical skill. In this instance, Gorgias aimed to remove blame from Palamedes by demonstrating to the audience that in order to prove that treason had been committed, a set of possible occurrences needed to have happened. First, there was communication between Palamedes and the enemy. Second, there was an exchange of a pledge in the form of hostages or money. And third, Palamedes was not detected by any guards or citizens. In his defense, Palamedes claims that a small sum of money would not have warranted such a large undertaking, and reasons that a large sum of money, if indeed such a transaction had been made, would require the aid of many confederates in order for it to be transported. Palamedes reasons further that such an exchange could neither have occurred at night, because the guards would be watching, nor in the day, because everyone would be able to see it taking place. Palamedes then explains that even if the aforementioned conditions had been arranged, such action needed to take place, either with or without confederates. However, if these confederates were free men, then they were free to disclose any information that they desired. But if they were slaves, there was a risk of them giving voluntary accusations in order to earn their freedom, or accusations by force under torture. Palamedes goes on to list a variety of possible motives, all of which he proves false. For example, he argues that Palamedes could not have committed treason with a foreign power, since he speaks no language other than Greek, and no Greek desires social power amongst barbarians. Through the defense of Palamedes, Gorgias demonstrates that a motive requires an advantage, such as status, wealth, honor, and security, and insists that Palamedes lacked a motive. Like the defense of Palamedes, the encomium, or praise of Helen, can be classified as an epideictic speech and it was said to have been Gorgias' number one showpiece, which he most often employed to attract students whenever he arrived in a new location. In their writings and speeches, Gorgias and other sophists often speculated about the structure and function of language as a framework for expressing the implications of action and the ways decisions about such actions were made. And this is exactly the purpose of the Encomium of Helen, in which Gorgias experiments with the nature of discourse and persuasion. In the speech, Gorgias expresses praise for Helen and rids her of the blame that she faced for allowing herself to be seduced and for leaving Sparta with Paris, which triggered the Trojan War. He discusses the possible reasons for Helen's journey to Troy by explaining that she could have been persuaded in one of four ways, in all of which she would have been helpless to resist, either by the gods, by physical force, by love, or by speech. If it were indeed the plan of the gods that caused Helen to depart for Troy, Gorgias argues that those who blame her should face blame themselves. Quote, for a human's anticipation cannot restrain a god's inclination. End quote. Gorgias explains that by nature, the weak are ruled by the strong. And since the gods are stronger than humans in all respects, Helen should be freed from her undesirable reputation. If, though, Helen was abducted by force, it is clear that the aggressor committed a crime. And so it should be Paris, not Helen, who should be blamed. And if Helen was persuaded by love, she should also be rid of ill repute, because, quote, if love is a god with the divine power of the gods, how could a weaker person refuse and reject him? But if love is a human sickness and a mental weakness, it must not be blamed as a mistake, but claimed as a misfortune, end quote. Finally, if speech persuaded Helen, Gorgias claims he can easily clear her of blame explaining, quote, Speech is a powerful master and achieves the most divine feats with the smallest and least evident body. It can stop fear, relieve pain, create joy, and increase pity, end quote. Essentially, the magical incantations of rhetoric could bring healing to the human soul by controlling powerful emotions. It is here that Gorgias compares the persuasive power of speech on the soul with the effect of drugs on the body, quote, just as different drugs draw forth different humors from the body, some putting a stop to disease, others to life, so too with words. Some cause pain, others joy, some strike fear, 
Some stir the audience to boldness, and some numb and bewitch the soul with evil persuasion. End quote. Gorgias argues that persuasive words have dunamis, or power, that is equivalent to that of the gods and is as strong as a physical force. Essentially, if a skilled rhetorician really wants you to do something, then you are going to do it, because of the all-encompassing power of language. Gorgias wasn't just a teacher of rhetoric, though, as he also wrote a philosophical treatise entitled On the Non-Existent, also called On Not Being. Unfortunately, the original text has been lost, and we only know about his arguments from two later commentaries, those being Against the Sophists, by Sextus Empiricus, and On Melissus, Xenophanes, and Gorgias, by an anonymous author that at one point was misattributed to Aristotle, so they are now known as Pseudo-Aristotle. Each commentary excludes material that is discussed in the other, and so we can only tentatively discuss his arguments. Presumably, Gorgias developed a skeptical argument and tried to prove four things with a series of complicated proofs. First, that nothing exists. Second, that even if something does exist, nothing about it can be knowable to humans. Third, that even if something is knowable, knowledge about it cannot be communicated or passed on to someone else. And fourth, that even if something can be communicated, it cannot be understood. And so, because of this, scholars have traditionally referred to Gorgias as the nihilist, who believes that nothing exists, the world is incomprehensible, and that the concept of truth is fictitious. However, the modern interpretation is that this label is misleading, in part because, if his arguments were really intended to support nihilism, or the belief that nothing exists, then they would be self-undermining, since the argument itself is something, and is trying to communicate knowledge. And so most scholars now think that Gorgias was trying to refute and parody the views of the Eleatic philosophers, particularly Parmenides' theory that being is one, unchanging and timeless. In doing so, Gorgias seems to be saying that true objectivity is impossible, since the human mind can never be separated from its possessor. For the first argument, where Gorgias argues that nothing exists, he means that thought and existence are not the same. By claiming that if thought and existence truly were the same, then everything that anyone thought would suddenly exist. He also attempted to prove that words and sensations couldn't be measured by the same standards. For even though words and sensations are both derived from the mind, they are essentially different. This is where his second idea comes into place, that even if something does exist, nothing about it can be knowable to humans. Though this was intended as a mockery of Parmenides and his followers, which he may have been one for some time, this seems to be a larger critique of pre-Socratic philosophy and their ambitious theories of underlying reality. Essentially, by arguing that nothing exists, and even if something existed, we have no idea of knowing it, then we are left with a reality, as it seems to us, which fits well with a sophistic belief in relativism and persuasion. Although rhetoric was taught and emphasized by every sophist, Gorgias placed more prominence upon it than any of the others, and much of the philosophical debate over both its nature and value begins with Gorgias. In fact, the central theme of Plato's dialogue, the Gorgias, is Socrates' attempt to seek the true definition of rhetoric and to unveil its flaws. Plato is one of Gorgias' greatest critics, and his dislike for sophistic doctrines is well known, and it is in his eponymous dialogue that both Gorgias himself and his rhetorical beliefs are ridiculed. In the Gorgias, Plato distinguishes between philosophy and rhetoric, characterizing Gorgias as an orator who entertains his audience with his eloquent words and who believes that it is unnecessary to learn the truth about actual matters when one has discovered the art of persuasion. The dialogue tells the story of a debate that occurred at a dinner gathering between Socrates and a small group of sophists at the home of Callicles. Socrates begins his cross-examination of Gorgias by asking him, quote, why don't you tell us yourself what the craft you're an expert in is, and hence what we're supposed to call you, end quote. Gorgias identifies his craft as rhetoric and affirms that he should be called a rhetorician. Socrates then attempts to show that rhetoric does not meet the requirements to actually be considered a techne, meaning art or craft, since it is a sensory skill based on mere experience, and he argues that rhetoric alone is not a moral endeavor. He then calls rhetoric a form of pandering that produces gratification and pleasure with no consideration for what's best, and he compares it to pastry baking and cosmetics, as these activities are aimed at surface adornment and an impersonation of what is really good. Gorgias is criticized because, quote, he would teach anyone who came to him wanting to learn oratory, but without expertise in what's just, 
end quote. Socrates believes that people need philosophy to teach them what is right, and that oratory cannot be righteous without philosophy. To use rhetoric for good, rhetoric cannot exist alone, and so he argues that it must depend on philosophy to guide its morality. Socrates therefore believes that morality is not inherent in rhetoric, and that without being grounded in philosophy, rhetoric is simply used to persuade for personal gain. Socrates says that rhetoric is somewhat dangerous to possess, both for the orator and for the audience, because it gives the ignorant the power to seem more knowledgeable than an expert on a subject. Although Gorgias admits that while rhetoricians give people the power of words, he argues that they are not instructors of morality, and so he can't help if his students might use their skills for immoral purposes. And so, unlike Protagoras, Gorgias does not profess to teach arete. In fact, he goes out of his way to deny that he could even teach such a thing, as he stresses the moral neutrality of rhetoric. In doing so, he compares rhetoric to boxing. If a trainer teaches someone to box, and he goes out and beats people up, it isn't the trainer's fault. Similarly, if he teaches a politician to argue effectively, it isn't his fault if he uses it for evil instead of good. On the other hand, Gorgias does concede that the power of rhetoric is a lot more potent than boxing or any other techne, since the best rhetoricians can speak persuasively on any topic. For example, they may be able to persuade a patient to take medicine, even if the doctor couldn't. At one point, Socrates gets Gorgias to agree that the rhetorician is actually more convincing in front of an ignorant audience than an expert one, because mastery of the tools of persuasion gives a man more conviction than mere facts. Gorgias accepts this criticism and proclaims, quote, Rhetoric is the only area of expertise you need to learn. You can ignore all the rest and still get the better of the experts, end quote. Throughout the dialogue, Gorgias is portrayed as a man with an ambivalent attitude towards truth, as a relativist who believes that it does not matter if one truly has knowledge of any given subject, only that he is perceived by others to have that knowledge. In the realm of rhetoric, it wasn't just the sophists who had major impact on 5th century BC Athenian political and intellectual life. There was also the so-called Attic orators. These were ten men, believed to have been canonized by Hellenistic Alexandrian scholars, who they believed were the greatest orators and logographers of the classical period. Included among them, in relatively correct chronology, were Antiphon, Lysias, Andocides, Isocrates, Isias, Lycurgus, Hyperiades, Eschines, Demosthenes, and Dinarchus. On this episode, we're only going to discuss Antiphon, because he was the earliest, and may have also been a sophist. The other nine will come in a future episode. Antiphon lived around 480 to 411 BC, and was from the deme of Ramnus. We have very little information about his early life and upbringing, but he took up rhetoric as a profession and also became a prominent statesman, especially in post periclean Athens, during the latter part of the Peloponnesian War. As a zealous supporter of the oligarchical party, he was largely responsible for the establishment of the 400 in 411 BC, which we too will discuss in a future episode. Upon restoration of the democracy shortly afterwards, he was accused of treason and condemned to death. As the earliest of the so-called Ten Attic Orators, and the fact that he was said to have composed a manual called the Techne, or Art of Rhetoric, Antiphon may be regarded as the founder of political oratory, though he never addressed the people himself except on the occasion of his trial. We have fragments of his speech, though, delivered in defense of his policy, called Peri Metastasios. His chief business, though, was that of a logographer, meaning he was a professional speechwriter. At this point, there were no professional lawyers in the modern sense, and it was up to the defendant or prosecutor to try their own cases. And so he wrote for those who felt that they needed expert assistance in order to conduct their own cases. Fifteen of Antiphon's speeches are extant. Twelve are mere exercises on fictitious cases, each comprising two speeches for prosecution and defense. The other three refer to real legal cases that went to trial. All of them, though, deal with cases of homicide. There is also long-standing uncertainty and scholarly controversy over whether the sophistic works of Antiphon and a treatise on the interpretation of dreams were also written by Antiphon the Orator, or whether they were written by a separate man known as Antiphon the Sophist. Antiphon the Sophist, if he wasn't the same person as Antiphon the Orator, also flourished in the last two decades of the 5th century BC, and almost nothing is known of his life, 
The Interpretation of Dreams treatise is notable because it was apparently the first literary work written on the subject of dream interpretation, or at least the first to have achieved wide circulation. It apparently became so popular that it was notable for even Cicero to reference it three centuries later. On the other hand, the sophistic treatise known as On Truth, of which only fragments have survived, is of great value to political theorists, because it juxtaposed the repressive nature of nomos, or conventional law, with physis, or natural law, especially human nature. In the treatise, nature is envisioned as requiring spontaneity and freedom, contrasting to the often gratuitous restrictions imposed by institutions. Quote, Most of the things which are legally just are nonetheless hostile to nature. By law, it has been laid down for the eyes what they should see and what they should not see, for the ears what they should hear and what they should not hear, for the tongue what it should speak and what it should not speak. For the hands, what they should do and what they should not do, and for the mind, what it should desire and what it should not desire. Since it champions the natural liberty and equality of all men, Antiphon's On Truth appears to anticipate the natural rights doctrine of the 17th century English philosopher John Locke. These views, though, suggest that its author could not be the same person as Antiphon the Orator, since it is interpreted as affirming strong egalitarian and libertarian principles, appropriate to a democracy, but antithetical to the oligarchical views of someone who was instrumental in the anti-democratic coup of 411 BC. Antiphon the Sophist was also a capable mathematician. Alongside his companion Bryson, he was the first to give an upper and lower bound for the value of pi by inscribing and then circumscribing a polygon around a circle and finally proceeding to calculate the polygon's areas. This method was applied to the problem of squaring the circle, which we discussed in episode 85. With Antiphon the Sophist, we start to touch upon the second generation of Sophists who were younger contemporaries of Protagoras and Gorgias. Arguably the most famous and most controversial of these was Hippias, who lived from around 460 to 400 BC and was originally from Elis. According to the Suda, he was a disciple of a man named Hegesidamos. Unfortunately, we don't know anything else about this man, but under his tutelage, Hippias blossomed. Owing to his intelligence and rhetorical skill, he was chosen by his fellow citizens to serve in various political roles for Ellis, and was even sent on a diplomatic mission to Sparta. But he was in every respect like the other sophists of the time, as he traveled about in various towns and districts of Greece for the purpose of teaching and public speaking. Hippias is chiefly memorable for his efforts in the direction of universality instead of specialization. He stressed self-sufficiency as a binding principle and used this principle in his teachings as he gathered knowledge in numerous subjects. In fact, he is the best example of a sophist being named an all-around wise man, and one could even call him a polymathes, or polymath, which is not an ancient Greek term, but a modern one that fuses two Greek words together, those being poly, meaning much or many, and mathes, meaning having learned. And so it means someone who has learned a lot an expertise on a significant number of subject areas. He had the advantage of an impressive memory and was deeply versed in all of the learning of his day. In this endeavor, he was said to have invented a system of mnemonics. And so, with a self-assuredness that was characteristic of later sophists, he claimed that he was an authority on all subjects and lectured not only on rhetoric, philosophy, and politics, but also on poetry, grammar, history, mathematics, astronomy, painting, and sculpture. He even claimed to have practical skills in the ordinary arts of life. Plato tells us that once he attended the Olympic Games and boasted that he was wearing on his body nothing that he had not made himself with his own hands, as he wove his own cloak, cobbled his own shoes, and even made the seal ring that he wore on his finger. His greatest asset, though, seems to have consisted in his ability to deliver grand show speeches. And Plato has him arrogantly boasting that he would travel to Olympia, and there he delivered before the assembled Greeks an oration on any subject that might be proposed to him, without preparation. And Philostratus, in fact, speaks of several such orations delivered at Olympia that created great sensation amongst the crowds. However, his knowledge always appears superficial, as he does not enter into the details of any particular art or science, and is satisfied with certain generalities, which enabled him to speak on everything without a thorough knowledge of any. This arrogance, combined with ignorance, is the main cause that provoked Plato to a severe criticism of Hippias, as the sophist enjoyed a very extensive reputation, and thus had a large influence upon the education of the youth of the higher classes.
Most of our knowledge of him is derived from Plato, who characterizes him as vain and arrogant in the two dialogues, Hippias Major and Hippias Minor. If Hippias published any of his speeches, then nothing has come down to us. However, it is known that he attempted literature in every form available, as Plato claims that he wrote epic poetry, tragedies, dithrams, and various orations, as well as works on grammar, music, rhythm, harmony, and a variety of other subjects. He seems to have been especially fond of choosing antiquarian and mythical subjects for his show speeches. Hippias is also credited with originating the idea of natural law as the foundation of morality. In doing so, he distinguished laws by nature from arbitrary conventions that differed according to the different times or regions in which they arose, and which were imposed by arbitrary human enactment and often unwillingly obeyed. And so Hippias saw natural law as a habitual entity that humans take part in without premeditation. For Hippias, natural law was never to be superseded, as it was universal. He also believed that the elite in all states are naturally indistinguishable from one another, and thus they should perceive each other as so. Because of this, they should consider and treat each other as citizens of a single state. These ideas were passed on through cynicism and then into stoicism, which was a philosophical school that became influential among the jurists who converted Roman law into legislation for the people. The Hippias Major... The authorship of this work by Plato is sometimes doubted, concerns the question about the beautiful, and purposely puts the knowledge and presumption of Hippias in a ludicrous light. The dialogue begins with Hippias arriving back at Athens to give a lecture after he had been home in Elis for a long time to perform some important diplomatic missions. One in particular was to Sparta. But before he gives the lecture, he finds himself engaged in conversation with Socrates, who comically says that he needs someone as competent as Hippias to give his opinion on the true nature of kalon, meaning beauty. As an adjective, it often means noble as well, so that the English translation often appears in this context. Anyways, Hippias was flattered and took Socrates' bait. Hippias then gives three definitions of beauty, each of which are cross-examined by Socrates and found to be inadequate. The first is that beauty is a pretty girl, to which Socrates responded that the same could be said of a liar, a horse, or even a pot. In short, there is an infinite number of beautiful things besides beautiful girls. So Hippias' second definition is that beauty is gold, because anything that appears ugly will appear beautiful when adorned with gold. Socrates essentially responds that this is not really the question he's asking. He doesn't want to know what is beautiful and what is not, but rather wishes for Hippias to define beauty and what makes beautiful things beautiful. This time, Hippias thinks he understands, and says for his third definition, that beauty is to be rich enough that one can provide a grand funeral for their deceased parents, and to be respected enough that their own offspring will do the same. Socrates responds with, what about Achilles or Heracles, who didn't get to do those things as they were heroes? Hippias' definition thus applies to only ordinary men, and so it's not correct. At this point, Socrates grows tired of Hippias' futile attempts, and so he decides to offer his own definitions. He puts forward four suggestions that he and Hippias both examine. That beauty is that which is appropriate, that which is useful, that which is favorable, and the pleasure that comes from seeing and hearing. As in several of Plato's other dialogues, Hippias Major has an anatreptic purpose, meaning the intent is to defeat commonly held opinions, without necessarily offering a resolution. And so after failing to formulate an acceptable answer, an exhausted Hippias berates Socrates and urges him instead of seeking beauty with mere talk and nonsense, they should seek, quote, the ability to produce a discourse well and beautifully in a court of law or a council house or before any other public body before which the discourse may be delivered, end quote. Socrates thus leaves and concludes with a sense of humor that his only certainty is that from now on he better understands the Greek proverb that beautiful things are difficult. The Hippias Minor, on the other hand, discusses the deficiency of our knowledge and characterizes Hippias as being ridiculously vain. In it, Plato presents Hippias as a self-avowed expert on Homeric criticism who overreaches his expertise. And so Hippias is exactly the sort of man that Socrates complains about in Plato's Apology, a man who develops expertise in one or more areas and then imagines that he knows everything. The dialogue begins with Hippias having just delivered a speech on who Homer intended to portray as the better man, Achilles or Odysseus. But Socrates could not follow his argument so that now that they are separated from the crowd, he wants to further investigate. Socrates begins by asking Hippias if Homer has not portrayed Achilles as a wily man. 
Hippias counters that he believes Achilles is the most straightforward man, taking Homer at face value when he has Achilles say that he hates those who think one thing and say another, or those who don't do what they said that they would do. Whereas Odysseus's resourceful behavior stems from his ability to lie well. Socrates argues that Achilles is such a cunning liar that he throws people off of the scent of his own deceptions, and that cunning liars are actually the best liars. Consequently, Odysseus and Achilles were both equally false and true. Socrates then discusses with Hippias about which kind of liar is the best, the man who deliberately contrives a lie, or the man who lies unwittingly, from not paying attention to what he is saying, or from changing his mind. Socrates argues that the voluntary lie is better than the involuntary lie, and Hippias objects, believing that laws punish those who harm others deliberately with purposeful lies and are more likely to excuse those who do harm by being negligent. Socrates proposes, possibly for the sheer dialectical fun of it, that it is better to do evil voluntarily than involuntarily. His case rests largely on an analogy with athletic skills, such as running and wrestling. He says that a runner or wrestler who deliberately throws a contest is better than the one who does his best and loses because he can do no better. Hippias suspects at this point that Socrates is being dishonest in the debate. Socrates counters that if he is troublesome, it is not intentional. That if he were being difficult deliberately, then he would be wily, which he is not. This is kind of a liar's paradox. Ultimately, Socrates convinces Hippias that justice is a matter of both power and knowledge, and that the powerful meaning the truly skilled man, is better than the clumsy one who makes mistakes from lack of knowledge and skill. The dialogue ends with Hippias' incredulity and helplessness at Socrates' verbal dexterity. Socrates even tells Hippias that he does not agree with himself and is perplexed about his own conclusion. Basically, the one who is able to lie about any subject purposefully, like Socrates could, representing the philosophers, must know the subject in depth and so is able to tell the truth but chooses not to. But those who lie about a subject unwittingly, like the sophists do, do so because they don't know the subject in depth. Ultimately, the philosopher who can lie knowingly is superior to the sophist who lies unwittingly. Although the dialogue seems to recommend clever evil over witless evil, this is not the real point. Its purpose, it seems, was for Plato to have Socrates best hippias with his own medicine and point out some of his critiques of sophists. Another sophist who is satirized at times by Plato is Prodicus, though he doesn't get his own dialogue. He lived from around 465 to 390 BC and was originally from Chios. Not much is known of his early life, but he was said to have been a disciple of Protagoras. He must have been influential enough in Chios because he was selected by his countrymen to make frequent trips to Athens as an official ambassador. While in Athens, he attracted much admiration for his oratorical skills that he permanently moved there at some point in the 430s BC and opened up a school of rhetoric. It is reported that his pupils included Socrates, Euripides, and the orators Theramenes and Isocrates. Lucian mentions that he was among those who held public lectures at Olympia, and Plato says that he, along with Gorgias and Hippias, were the only ones considered competent enough to instruct the youth in any city. In particular, he had great honors paid to him in Thebes and Sparta. It was reported that people flocked to hear Prodicus, although he purportedly had an unpleasant-sounding voice. For example, according to Philostratus, while he was a prisoner in Boeotia, Xenophon desired to hear Prodicus so much that he came up with the required bail and went to quench his curiosity. Like the other sophists, Prodicus delivered lectures in return for payment, reportedly ranging from half a drachma to 50 drachmae probably according to whether the audience members limit themselves to a single lecture or a more complete course. And so Prodicus is said to have amassed a great amount of money. Despite this, though, Plato treats him with a greater level of respect than the other sophists. In several of the Platonic dialogues, Socrates appears as his friend and companion, which reveals that at the very least, the two had a close personal relationship, and that Socrates attended at least a few of his lectures. He wasn't just a sophist, though, as Aristophanes describes him as the most remarkable of the natural philosophers for his wisdom and character. Because he taught both philosophy and politics, and not just rhetoric, Plato presents his instructions as chiefly ethical and gives preferences to his ideas on courage, rashness, boldness, and so forth, over similar attempts by other sophists. Prodicus also made linguistics and ethics prominent in his curriculum. The sophists in general, as we mentioned, pioneered in literary analysis of the words found in Homer and other texts, but this was especially true of Prodicus. Several of Plato's dialogues focus upon Prodicus' linguistic theory and his insistence upon orthopoeia, meaning the correct use of words. 
which focuses on the literal meaning of words and the author's original intent. This type of education would have been useful for the interpretation of laws and other written documents in the Athenian courts. Thucydides is said to have gained from him his accuracy in the use of words. In Plato's Cratylus, Socrates jokes that if he could have afforded the 50 drachmae lectures, he would now be an expert on the correctness of names, but he must make do with the cheap one drachma lecture. For Socrates, correct language was the prerequisite for correct living, including an efficient government. And his constant search for precise definitions of things like virtue or courage can be seen as a development of the linguistic precision urged by Prodicus. Though his linguistic teaching undoubtedly included semantic distinctions between ethical terms, Prodicus had stopped at that threshold. None of Prodicus's lectures has come down to us in its original form, though the content of one of his ethics speeches is still known. It's titled Horai, but it is better known as The Choice of Heracles. Though no fragments of it remain, the outline of it has been preserved in Xenophon's memorabilia. It concerns an allegorical parable in which Heracles had to make a choice between virtue and vice. When Heracles was just a boy, but transitioning into manhood, so while he was a shepherd at Mount Kitharone, he went away to ponder his future and happened to symbolically sit at a crossroads. Two women came towards him, one from each path. The first that spoke to him was plump and soft, and enhanced with makeup and fancy clothes. She promised that if he went down her path, his life would be full of pleasures, and that there would be no hardships. He would reap the fruits of other people's toil. Her name was Vice. The other woman, named Virtue, was much more modestly dressed, and was obviously pure. She gave Heracles advice, saying that nothing that turns out good and fair ever comes without hard work. Vice said that life was too hard, but Virtue said that the easy path will lead to frustration and no pleasure at all. The sweetest sight, after all, is the sight of something you have made yourself. Heracles thus chose the life of hard work, and ultimately received the favor of the gods for it, because people who follow the way of vice die forgotten. Another speech, apparently by Prodicus, is mentioned in the spuriously attributed Platonic dialogue titled Erixius. In the dialogue, Socrates has a conversation with three men. Critias, Erixius, and Erasistratus, in the Stoa of Zeus Eleutherius about wealth and virtue. During the intellectual exchange, Prodicus is cited for his belief that the value of external goods depends upon the use that is made of them. Prodicus also appears in another spuriously attributed Platonic dialogue titled Axiochus, which was named after the uncle of Alcibiades. In the dialogue, Axiochus is close to death and is scared by the experience. So Socrates comes to his bedside and consoles him with a wide variety of teachings to help him welcome death as the release of the soul to a better place. One of the teachings are attributed to Prodicus, who regards earthly life as worthless and argues that we must desire our freedom from earth for a life in the heavenly and cognate aether. Also attributed to Prodicus is a doctrine that death is not to be feared, as it affects neither the living nor the departed. Like some of his fellow sophists, Prodicus also interpreted religion through the framework of naturalism. He regarded the gods as personifications of natural objects, such as the sun, the moon, rivers, fountains, and whatever else contributes to the comfort of our life. According to Sextus Empiricus, he was an atheist, and Cicero remarks that some of his doctrines were subversive of religion. His theory was that primitive man was so impressed with the gifts nature provided him for the furtherance of his life that he believed them to be the discovery of gods or themselves to embody the head god. This theory was not only remarkable for its rationalization, but for its discernment of a close connection between religion and agriculture. Because of these views apparently, like Socrates, Prodicus was said to have been put to death by the Athenians on the charge of corrupting the youth. The last major old sophist that we will discuss is Thrasymachus. The precise years of his life are hard to determine. Tradition holds that he lived from around 459 to 400 BC, but Cicero seems to imply that Gorgias and Thrasymachus were contemporaries, so he may have been born earlier. Regardless, he was originally from Chalcedon, opposite of Byzantium on the Bosphorus. Since he is the butt of one of Aristophanes' jokes in his first play, The Banqueteers, which was performed in 427 BC, he probably came to Athens sometime by the 430s BC, in order to have been teaching and known well enough in Athens by the time that Aristophanes was flourishing. Scholars tend to believe that regardless of his lifespan, he was active in Athens during the last three decades of the 5th century BC. The exact nature of his work and thought is unclear as well, though. Plato mentions Thrasymachus as a successful rhetorician in his Phaedrus, but attributes nothing significant to him. 
But Aristotle mentions Thrasymachus in his Sophistical Refutations, where he credits him with a pivotal role in the development of rhetorical theory. Specifically, he is credited with an increase in the rhythmic character of Greek oratory, especially the use of the paeonic hymn in prose, and a greater appeal to the emotions through gesture. Similarly, Dionysus of Halicarnassus praises Thrasymachus for various rhetorical skills in his speech titled On Isaias, finding Thrasymachus to sound, quote, pure, subtle, inventive, and able, and according as he wishes, to speak either with terseness or with an abundance of words, end quote. Still, though, Dionysus found Thrasymachus as a second-rate orator, besides the inclusive and charming Lysias, his younger contemporary, because he had left no forensic speeches behind, only handbooks and display speeches. Thrasymachus, though, arguably is best known as a character in Plato's Republic. His name means fierce fighter, and he is noted for his unabashed, even reckless defense of his position about justice, in which he applies relativism to the sphere of morality. If there is no such thing as absolute truth, then truth is what is advantageous to the strong, so that, quote, justice is the advantage of the stronger, and that injustice if it is on a large enough scale, is stronger, freer, and more masterly than justice, end quote. He also draws a distinction between nomos and physis and says that only by custom are there social rules and laws of justice, and these laws may or may not reflect the natural order of things. It's thus natural for the strong to dominate the weak, whereas it's mere custom for the weak to come together and restrict the power of the strong. Socrates counters by forcing him to admit that there is some standard of wise rule, and then argues that this suggests a standard of justice beyond the advantage of the stronger. And so here, Thrasymachus seems to be following the tradition of the other sophists who advocate for natural law and unmasked morality as nothing but social convention, as we have discussed. There is a long philosophical tradition of exploring what exactly Thrasymachus meant in Book 1 of Plato's Republic, and of taking his statements as a coherent political assertion, rather than as simply being Plato's straw man. And so scholars have interpreted Thrasymachus and his definition of justice as representing the city and its laws, and are in a sense opposed to Socrates and to philosophy in general. We will explore Thrasymachus and his scholarly interpretation in the Republic in more detail in future episodes on Plato. As we have seen throughout this episode, Plato, through Socrates, was particularly dismissive of Sophism in general and most of the Sophists specifically, though he did admire a few of them, like Protagoras and Prodicus. Nevertheless, it is unlikely that the criticism of Socrates and Plato had much impact on public sentiment, although it may well have been the case that many Athenians would have instinctively agreed with the literary characterization of Sophists as money-grubbing charlatans, especially those who could not afford their services. However, in the 4th century BC, schools of rhetoric began to emerge in the Greek-speaking world, including one in Athens that was ran by Isocrates, who was the pupil of several sophists. And at the same time, the so-called Attic orators would flourish as logographers for legal cases, all of which indicate that the discipline of rhetoric had achieved some respectability. Aristotle also instructed his pupils in oratory as well as in philosophy, and he wrote a highly influential treatise on the subject, titled Rhetoric. All of this then indicates the discipline of rhetoric had achieved some respectability. Even after the Greek states lost their independence and rhetoric ceased to have any political importance, it still remained the centerpiece of higher education. However, the hostility between practitioners of rhetoric and those who practice philosophy would endure almost throughout antiquity. Now that we have finished our very long cultural tour of the 5th century BC, aside from Socrates, who we are going to save for when we cover Xenophon and Plato, it is now time to bring the 5th century BC to a close, and with a bang. Where we last left the narrative, the Greek world was tenuously at peace, following almost five decades of war with the Persians and with each other. But the signings of the Peace of Callias in 449 BC and the Thirty Years' Peace in 445 BC had brought the Persian Wars and the First Peloponnesian War, respectively, to a close. That peace, though, would not last 30 years. In fact, it didn't even make it half of that, and its dissolution would usher in a more infamous Peloponnesian War between Athens, Sparta, all of their allies, and eventually the Persians. So in the next episode, we will pick up where we left off back in episode 43, and introduce one of our main primary sources for the war, as well as discuss the internal politics in Athens during the 440s and 430s BC. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 88, Thucydides and Periclean Politics. (laughs) 